So now we need to add some rendering attributes to our particles. And we can either do this manually or we can do it using the shelf tool here, the drive particle simulation shelf tool. And we can see here at the end at the end here we've got instance, render and sprite, which are the three different ways in which you can render particles. Instance is a way of getting the renderer at render time to copy geometry onto the points of your particle system. And that's quite complicated to set up manually, so it is quite useful to use the shelf tool for that. Render allows you to set various basic default ways of rendering your particles, spheres, disks, and so on. And that, in fact, is quite easy to set up manually, just using a render node, which we'll do in a moment. Sprite copies to each of the points in your particle system a sprite, which is a flat square object which always faces the camera. And again, it's quite useful to use the shelf button to set that up because it creates various shaders that are useful for us to use. But let's start by setting up a render type for these particles which are coming out of our original stream of particles. So let's lay down a render. And I'm going to hit P to bring up parameters pane. And I want to give them a size of 1. And I want to render them as disks. And I want to render them without sphere normals. And I want to do the same for these particles that are forming our trails. So I'm going to lay down another render node and insert it here. And I'm going to render as disks, give it a size of 1, and no sphere normals. The next thing I want to do is give some color to our particles. So let's lay down a color pop like so. And let's create some space here. And the color pop allows me to set both the color and the alpha of our particles. So I'm going to use a ramp for our color. And I'm going to have a first color which is uh, a greeny color. So let's give that a green. And then the second color, I'm going to have a uh, blue, like so. And the lookup value here, which is an expression, allows me to set the color of each particle according to the expression that's here. And I'm going to just have rand dollar ID, which sets the color slightly differently for each particle. And then for the alpha value in this case, I can just leave this as a parameter and I'm going to give it a value of 1. So they're going to be opaque. And I also need to set up the color of the particles being generated by our split here. And I'm going to in this case, leave the color with a value of pass, which means that the color is going to be inherited from the color of the particles which generate uh, these particles that we're splitting off. And you can see here that we've inherited the CD or color attribute. So we leave that as pass, but I'm going to change the alpha value and I'm going to base it on a parameter. And the value I'm going to give it is 1 minus dollar life times 0 0.1. So the maximum value it's going to have is 0 0.1. Dollar life is a variable that varies between 0 and 1 according to the age of the particle. So when the particle is at the end of its life, life will have a value of 1 when it's just been born it'll have a value of zero. So what this does is ensure that our particles have an alpha of 
0.1 or rather 0.1 at the beginning of their life and then as they get older the alpha value decreases until it reaches zero. The next thing that I need to do is set up some size parameters which will control the size of the disks. And I can do this using a property pop. So let's lay one down here for initial stream of particles. And the size is determined here using uniform scale. And I'm going to, for our original particles, delete that. And just give it a default value of 0 0.3. But for the trail particles, I'm going to lay down another property so pop. For the trail particles, I'm going to have an expression in here. And what I'm going to do is take 0.15 plus rand dollar ID times 0.15. In other words, a quantity that varies between 0.15 and 0.3. And then I'm going to multiply it by one minor dollars dollar life. So these are going to start at a random value around 0.3, and then as the particles get older, they will get smaller and smaller until they disappear. And finally, I'm going to use this. Uh, I'm going to put down a color pop here and I'm going to give this an alpha value of zero to ensure that it never shows up in the render. This is the particle which we're using as the target for our follow pop. So that set up the rendering attributes for our particles except for these that are in the explosion. So let's have a look and see what they look like. And note that you always have to rewind your simulation to get any changes to take effect. So I'm going to just move to that place there, frame 24, and then I'm going to take a render. Let's create a render node. And I think I have a camera set up here already. So let's zoom in a little bit. And let's take a render. And we can see that those are successfully being rendered as disks. Well, the next thing to do is to set up the rendering of the explosion. And the first thing I'm going to do is add some color. And I'm going to use a ramp for the color. And we're going to start with a yellowy color. Actually, we seem to have selected the end. So we're going to end with a red color. And we're going to start with a yellowy color. And the lookup we're going to use is going to be the life of the particle. So it's going to start yellow and end up red. The next thing we're going to do is set up the alpha value for this. And for the alpha, we're going to use a parameter. And it's going to be the life, 1 minus life, sorry, 1 minus life, times 0.3. So again, these are going to fade out as they get older. And finally, I'm going to use the shelf tool to set these up to render as sprites. So let's select the shelf tool and it's automatically discovered the particle system that I'm using and it's added this sprite node after our collect here. But in fact I want the sprite only to apply to the 
nodes that are part of the explosion. So let's insert it here, like so. And I'm going to add a rotate and size attribute. The rotation I'm going to give it is rand.id times 360. So each sprite will be randomly rotated around its axis. And the scale that I'm going to give it is 1 minus dollar life. And 1 minus dollar life. The other thing that the Sprite Shelf tool has done is change the material of our node to shop the, the Sprite shader here, which is in the shop context. And I'm going to change the Sprite shader so that it has an emission of 0.5 and I'm going to turn down its Lambert intensity and its ambient intensity to zero. Now, by default, it uses this smoke puff as the texture that applies to each of the sprites. And that's fine for this purpose, in fact. But we do have a problem, because we now have two different types of render combined in a single pop network. We've got uh, these particles on this side of our network which are going to be rendered as disks and we've got these here which are going to be rendered as sprites and you can't really combine them because what's going to happen is all of these are going to be rendered as sprites so we're going to need to separate out here at the object level or rather the geometry level the different types of particle. So I'm going to lay down a blast node and I'm going to use it to delete some of the groups that we created earlier. And notice how the points that come out of this, we've got 3000 points here, preserve all of the groups that we created in our pop network. So I can use this blast node to delete some of these groups, so I'm going to delete everything that's not the explosion. And I'm then going to Control c Control v to copy this, and I'm going to delete non-selected. So everything coming out of this node will be the explosion, and everything coming out of this node will be not the explosion. In other words, the stuff that we want to render as disks. And I'm going to add a null at the end of this, and I'm going to call it Jet Out. And I'm going to put the display flag back here on the explosion particles. So what this should mean, that when our particles reach the point of exploding here, we can render and we should find, and there we are, that we get this nice explosion effect. But we've still got the sphere in the middle of that, and we may not want that. We may want the sphere to disappear pretty quickly after the explosion starts. So let's see what we can do about that. Let's see when the explosion starts. Starting there at about frame 16, 17. And what we can do is go back to our target and on the render tab we have a checkbox which enables this display parameter 
and this controls whether or not our sphere is going to be rendered. So it's initially 1, and then after frame 18, say, we want it to be 0. So we could say $FF is less than 17. And that should ensure that it renders at every frame below 17, but thereafter is invisible. So the final step is to create a further geometry node, which is going to be used for our trail, and delete the file, and I'm going to use an object merge to bring in the jet out that we created in the emitter object. And then I'm going to render this going to create a new shader. I'm going to create a constant shader. And then I'm going to apply it to this trail object. So what we should find is that we get a render which renders the explosion as sprites and everything else as disks. And the final step is on our mantra node to, in the sampling tab, allow motion blur and then on our two objects which are rendering our particles to enable geometry velocity blur. And that will use any V attribute, any velocity or V attribute on our particles to blur the render. So let's try rendering that again. And as we can see, we're getting nice blurred trails for our particles. So that's an introduction to using particle systems or POPs in Houdini. I hope it's been useful.